Welcome to D Connection TV. My name is Donzelay Powell with D Connects LLC. Today we will be speaking with some of our great community partners. We want to hear what they have to say today and what they've been doing here in our local community. I'll let each of them introduce themselves, starting with Gerald. Thank you. Appreciate you allowing us to be here. Uh, Gerald Brown with Dispas House. I'm the CEO there. Mm -hmm. Clifton Harris with the Urban League of Middle Tennessee. I'm the president and CEO there. Demetrius Short with Transformation Life Center, founder and CEO. And I'm Matthew Burlakis, president and CEO of Goodwill Industries of Middle Tennessee. Great. So part of the purpose of today's show, we want to make sure that both businesses and the community are aware. What are all these community agencies doing out here? It's like everyone has their silos and they don't really understand what the resources that are a phone call away or a trip away, an email away, in knowing how to get people uh, the resources that they need. So if you could just expound a little bit, what types of services do you provide? Are there any particular uh, criteria that you're looking for in the people that you serve? Just give, give us a rundown of what you did. Okay, well, Dispers House has been around for 45 years and we help men who are transitioning out of incarceration with housing and supportive services. And what we just want to impress upon the community is we're here to help, and we really need the, the community's help to do that, to help support the guys who are transitioning into our care. It, it takes a village to raise anyone, and let alone somebody that's going back into society. It's imperative that the community is a part of our program, as well as the others on the panels. Right, because I, I assume you definitely, if they're coming back to the community one way or another, <laughs> yes, so are. you at least want it to be a good transition. It would be in the community's best interest that we right. support people on their journey back into society. Perfect. And then, of course, you know, the Urban League has been around for, uh, for mm, 52 years. We're going to celebrate okay. 52 years locally right. and 110 years nationally. Um, and we do workforce development, econom economic development, and civic engagement and educational initiatives you know, for employment services you know, to help people get livable ways, ways jobs. Got it. At Transformation Life Center, uh, because of my struggle going to school and coming to understand the cost of education mm -hmm. and uh, students now deciding, should I get that degree and still not have a job and now I have debt uh, and I still feel a little hopeless, our job is to ignite inspire and transform the lives of collegiate students who then go back and service underserved youth to create a life cycle of success for students to have tangible uh, role models um, who are going to be affluent individuals in the Nashville community. So our job is to ignite purpose, find out what they are called to do, and then provide the inspiration. You know, you want to be a doctor, don't give up because it's hard. So we bring mentors and host TED Talks and workshops to uh, help assist those uh, collegiate students get across the stage and break down barriers. Mm -hmm. And then once we ignite, inspire, they are to transform into our future pastors, future lawmen, future firemen and whatever. And then that keeps Nashville fresh and then they give it back by going into underserved communities to students or individuals who don't have a father or, or have an environment that's conducive of pushing success. And we create a pathway to success, success for then a uh, underserved community uh, demographic and background. Right, that cycle, got it. Next. So for Goodwill, I'll give you the, the what, how, and the why. Okay. So what we do is to provide employment and training opportunities to individuals with disabilities and others with barriers to employment. Mm -hmm. So it's formerly incarcerated, seniors, youth, veterans, immigrants. And how we do that is through the collection, processing, and sales of donated goods. Mm -hmm. And why we do it, which is the cause, the purpose, the belief, why you get up every morning and do this, is because we believe that everybody should have the opportunity to reach their full potential through the power of work. Great, great. All, all four sound like amazing <clears throat> organizations. So I am curious, just give me a little bit more information. Are there what do your programs, or are there any specific services that you give or that you um, kind of facilitate that you feel like the public needs to know that this is here? So yes, I might understand that you are dealing with people that are going through school, trying to help them through that process. What types of things do you all do in order to let either business people or those collegiate students, how do people even know that you're here and, and what do you need for them? Well, I will say this, that uh... Where, where in, you, uh, any, you know, anybody. 
Uh, I'll start. I think we're keep going in this order. Let's <laughs> break it up a little bit. But I appreciate you allowing this platform because I think uh, all of us in nonprofit want to make sure that we uh, raise our visibility and awareness of right. how we're supporting people. But I think more importantly, hopefully the panel can agree with this, that we should do some more collaborating so we can have a grander impact on the, on the, on the community as a whole and the populations that we serve. Because there's some overlap there. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we do is heal and build. What we do is try to take the anxiety out of folks transitioning back into society. And just think about it, people have post-traumatic uh, syndrome from coming out of incarceration and had trauma prior to that. So there's a lot of compound issues that folks who are transitioning out of incarceration are faced with, and we're kind of that stop, that buffer. If they didn't have us, what do they have? They're kind of left up to themselves to kind of uh, transition back into society and nobody kind of guide them and support them. And, and so that's one of the things that we do is really just take the anxiety out of transition out of incarceration. And then we do some wraparound services that are holistic as well as evidence-based that's uh, it's designed to help the guys heal and build, uh, like mental health, physical health, dental services, uh, spiritual guidance. We do kind of any and everything that helps build a person to be whole. And it's up to them from that standpoint now that they know better, and hopefully they'll do better. Good, good. So I do believe um, you all have a dinner with community, the community yeah. gets to participate. Just it kind is. of give us real quick what that's like. So in order for, you know, just give a quick example. You know what? In order for me to get to know any of you all, the best way to do that is break bread with you. And so what we do is bring in volunteers to come and break bread with our guys. So it takes the anxiety out of our guys of talking to a complete stranger who's there to really care for them and get to know them. And also for society to realize that everybody who's been incarcerated is not a bad person. They may have made a bad mistake and they paid their debt to society. Now it's time for society to, society to embrace them. So it's, uh, it's twofold. Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. So I think, you know, what Gerald said, you know, you know, we need to collaborate more, you know, is, is key to serving our beloved community. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we'll be partnering with, with Gerald, Business House, you know, on, you, <laughs> you know, on some uh, computer uh, stuff, you know, and we're already partnering with, with Matt, you know, um, in, uh, with um, uh, our, t our TBA program that will um, allow individuals you know, to get good paying jobs you know, through the weatherization uh, initiative. Um, and at some point in the future, you know, yes. I hope to be partnering with Transformation Ministries. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's about you know, making sure that people have a livable wage job. Right. Because if the cost of living in Nashville is, or the cost to live comfortably in Nashville, as they say, is $86,000 uh, a year, that is not seven twenty-five an hour. You know, that is $41.85 an hour. And so people either have to go back to school and major in something that's going to pay them that kind of wage or get a certification in a trade that's going to pay them that kind of money to live that kind of that kind of uh, life you know, here in Nashville because the cost of living in Nashville is high. And for, for us, we've been intentional in the last few years with our program starting at Fisk University, where I'm an alum. Um, and creating a track record of success with uh, one year the entire freshman class um, signing up and registering for our Pathway to Success initiative, which is where our personal and professional development takes place. It's where these students are afraid. Mom drops them off. Uh, mom may be in California, and you have one ticket to get home uh, in, in three months. You know, don't have the funds for them to have that, that comfort and that support. So we bring that comfort and support to the universities. So now we're on, active on seven universities. Uh, we've even penetrated uh, two two-year colleges, Nashville State and Union College. So we uh, are servicing students, and the barriers you would you wouldn't uh, imagine seven hundred and fifty dollars. There are students who drop out of school because they have a balance of seven hundred and fifty dollars. You would think it would be higher, mm -hmm. but these barriers. Mom doesn't have it. We um, host an annual five k race. I run in a full suit and sneakers. Uh, for the nine, not for the nine, ninth year, and we bring our whole entire community together to not learn about summer, us. In this in September, <laughs> September, that's why I see you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, the, I'm the crazy guy that runs in the suit. Yeah, okay. And um, we raise we raise money and give away scholarships on the spot. No oh, essays. Wow. Oh, wow. No, tell me about this. It is just using the course, the 5K course. Mm -hmm. Are you going to give up at one? Are you going to quit at two? Get to uh, mile three, and we have our CEOs. Our our community partners at the finish line, rewarding these students on the spot um, and breaking down those financial barriers. We saved a, a student 3.9 GP at Tennessee State. He was going to be purged from the university on Tuesday after our race. 
He won a thousand dollar scholarship at the race, and it saved him from being kicked off campus. A three point nine GPA mm -hmm. because he did not have money. He was a thousand dollars short in right. that scholarship, and that anxiety off of his face to now be able to go back into the classroom. And he showed me walking through Tennessee State. He said, "All these students, about a thousand students, are in line to get financially cleared." And I'm going, shouldn't they be in the classroom? You know, but those financial barriers. So we're partnering with the schools and we use the 5K race to bring people out to say, hey, Transformation Life Center is here. We're going to break down some barriers financially. And then the students can opt into our uh, personal and professional development. Now that we transform your body, now let's transform you in the classroom. Uh, we do TED Talks and we bring uh, individuals like the panel here to come and speak and bring CEOs, we have um, ex-felons that come and took about, talk about the dangers of doing things wrong. Right. Right. Yeah. One of our right. guys, Brad Miser, carried a gun, but he's 14, he's 46 now, and he does a, a session called, I can't, but I can. Mm -hmm. I can never be a judge because I have felony, but I can be successful, and he's an entrepreneur. So we do all those types well, of things in the class. I definitely, I appreciate you for being alumni and, and circling back around, not forgetting uh, where you came from, what the struggles are, so I appreciate that. Uh, for you, Matthew and Goodwill? Goodwill's founder, uh, the Reverend Edgar J. Helms, believed in the hand up and not the handout. Mm -hmm. So Goodwill is an employer. It's about employment and empowerment. So we employ somewhere north of 1,500 individuals. 90% of those are mission-related, which means they have a disability or they have a barrier to employment, formerly incarcerated veterans. The empowerment side is then uh, giving people an opportunity when, when they come through our career solution centers uh, to gain access to our career counselors, career navigators that may help them advance their education. It may help them in their certifications in healthcare and construction, janitorial, forklift, call center, so they can get certified and then go right out there and get employed. Um, so it's both about coming to work for goodwill or it's about us helping you reach your full potential in whatever direction that you want to go. Great, and I am familiar with uh, one of your construction program there, and it's fabulous. The teacher absolutely do a fantastic job of working with the students and making sure that they really have that hands-on experience. So appreciate you um, having programs like that in place to try to help everyone, whether they like working with their hands, whether they like reading books, whatever it is, it's like trying to help them navigate where where's the best place for them to be and have the resources to do that. So thank you all. Um, just out of curiosity, I always like to ask and kind of find out, how did you even get into nonprofits? How did, how did any, this whole arena, how did that come about? Were you, were you small and you decided this was what I always wanted to do? Did something change? Just, just curious. I'm going to punt it down to the other end. <laughs> we'll work our way back. Yeah, that works. <laughs> this program isn't long enough to answer that question. Um, yeah. You know, I think I just I just took that left turn at Albuquerque. Uh, I took that fork in the road, the road less traveled, mm -hmm. for me. Um, I was I was you know in Charlotte um, working uh, at Camelot Music uh, and uh, minimum wage job, and decided I wanted to learn American Sign Language. Went to the community college there in Charlotte. Two years later, came uh, became fluent in American Sign Language. Thought that's what I wanted to do. Um, but I didn't want to live in Charlotte, so I packed my dog up, I moved to Nashville, and failed to, to realize that the School for the Deaf is in Knoxville, the School for the Blind is in Nashville, and I didn't want to go to Knoxville. So I really had to pivot. I had to think about, well, if it's not going to be an interpreter for sign language, you know, what else can I do? And so I was talking with a friend who was deaf, and she was you know, trying to help me to decide, you know, what it is that I want to do in my life, and she signed to me... You know, most people live on the world, few live in it. What do you want to do? And to me, I mean, I thought about that a long time, and, and I just, I think nonprofit work is living in the world. It's really seeing uh, the best and the worst of people um, in, in just trying to make a difference and the sacrifices that, that go along with it. But that was, that was a turning point for me, and I've been in nonprofit for 25 years. So and I have said every day, that I love getting up and coming to work. There's not been one day in 25 years that I've just said, oh, I don't want to go to work. Wow, that's mm -hmm. a blessing. So, Demetrius? Unbeknownst to me, in 1992, when I matriculated to Fisk, um, 
thinking I was going to go to the major leagues to play football. Um, I was called to do it before I even knew I was called. So sleeping in the dorm director's office with a $700 suit on, $1,000 alligator shoes, and not being financially cleared. I went to school an extra year and a half um, because of the shame of calling back to my parents and saying, hey, I don't have money. So I was eating canned food, um, coming out in the morning with a smile on my face, but then tears running down my eyes that why am I struggling and having to walk from Fisk University to Murphy Road to my internships at Caterpillar with a suit on, briefcase. It was Herman Street. It wasn't a gold stand. You didn't mm -hmm. walk through there in 92. <laughs> right. So a man in a suit, no. briefcase, this was easy catch for yeah. You just right. got right here, but I, I didn't quit. And when I graduated from Fisk, I, I came back as an alum and I walked the same route now with a $72,000 job with, my, with IBM. And I had tears rolling in my eyes. I said, Lord, why did I have to do it this way? And he said, every step you took was a step towards your success. Mm -hmm. And that's when my nonprofit was born. How can I help one student? Just one. That was all I wanted. Just one student. And then it came to two and three. And now... Nine years later, here I am uh, celebrating 10 years of nonprofit service. Uh, now we've gone from one university, as I stated, to seven universities and growing. We see our 5K race scholarship run being in all 50 states. You know, in the next 20 years, we see uh, it being global. We're going to Nairobi, Kenya next year to run the inaugural uh, Steps of Success, Nairobi, Kenya edition, and sending hundreds of shoes to Nairobi, Kenya. So I, I was called living it. And when you can live the struggle, you can identify with right. students. So I've, I've lived it before they did, and now it's easy for me to relate and help them tear down boundaries that would prohibit them that did not prohibit me. So we instill a lot of what uh, helped me, good people in your life, a don't quit attitude back into our students, and all we ask them to do is carry it forward and pay right. it back. So right. good. that's how we got started. Cliff? Well, I attended St. Augustine's College in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, HBCU, and I had the pleasure of doing an internship in, in New York uh, with an insurance company. I won't call any name because I want to blast them out. <laughs> um, but I had the pleasure of working in the bond department. And one of my mentors, a uh, young lady, um, I ended up you know, saving kind of as a rookie intern saving the day you know, on some misinformation that they had um, and I brought it you know, to her attention and rather than saying thank you and you know, you know she responded to me um, just remember I got mine you're trying to get yours and I thought if this is corporate America I really don't want any part of it and it awakened and, and reminded me that my my parents and my grandparents had vocations that was about serving people. Mm -hmm. And so their jobs, their careers was about serving people. And I remember my grandfather riding up and down the road and leaving he owned the farm and he left fresh produce and fresh meat you know, on people's steps. He sold them their homestead. Uh, we had cabinet makers you know, in the community, we had carpenters in the community, and when someone needed their house built or a you know, wing built on their house, the neighborhood came in. And so that started my path you know, for nonprofit. Okay, okay, makes total sense. It's funny the different paths that we take and the reasons how we might have a plan, but then that plan gets derailed or it, it just changes. And But when you look back in hindsight, it always seems yeah. to work itself out some Very type of way. So, I know that we, well, I'm sure that you've noticed the growth in Nashville. Um, I, don't no. think, I think it would be a little hard for you to have <laughs> not. So, just let me know if there's any trends or any things that you've seen over these last few years where you notice who is in the most need for services that you just kind of recognize and what types of services, not just for your agencies per se, but just in general, that you feel like they need? What are those barriers to people having success or for, um, I, just for me, I know we've talked about the traffic, however, I know transportation is one, but what do you all see in your day to day that you're like, if these things right here are truly a barrier to a lot of people? And that, and if you uh, happen to have any services that pertain to that, that's great. But just in general as well. Anyway. Who wants to go first? 
You go. You talk. Yeah, you're ready, Clifton. I know. <laughs> um, so for me, you know, it is the disparity, you know, amongst or for people of color mm -hmm. um, in the area of employment, in the area of education, um, and especially in the area, you know, of uh, wealth building. Um, those are some of the trends that I'm seeing. We're on a, according to Prosperity Now, um, people of color, specifically African Americans, are on a, a trajectory and all that by uh, 2052, um, we will be at zero wealth. You know, and so that's kind of hard to fathom, you know, but when you look at the disparity, you know, amongst unemployment rates, you know, what have you, uh, across the board and you know, all across races, you can really see that, and I've seen the trend of Nashville becoming a city of haves and have-nots. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things that I see is, is very similar to one of the reasons I'm in nonprofit is that uh, people don't know what they don't know, right? Okay. And so a lot of times people are a product of their environment. And, and so my story, and I'll kind of tie this in on what I see some of the gaps are, is uh, that I was raised in a single parent home in Memphis, Tennessee, in the inner city portion of Memphis, Tennessee, and I saw people around me that was living a lifestyle that either ended up being incarcerated or being um, six feet under. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I saw that I didn't want to be a statistic. So it started prior to college for me. I just saw a lot of people in and around me that were making bad choices. Right. And if I look at people now, you think about the level of crime that's taking place here in Nashville, and then people say, oh, it's the youth. Well, they don't know any better. If they're giving some hope, if they're giving some direction, if they see something different than what they see outside, then maybe they'll give them an opportunity to say, hey, I can make another choice that's better than what everybody else is in my peer group, everybody else in my neighborhood is doing. Uh, and I think that's a big gap that we really need to reach back, and especially for those of us who are engaged in, in nonprofit or business owners that want to do something about it. They need to do more than just giving their resources. They need to give their time and their expertise to those young folks that don't know another way because that's going to be continuously perpetuated generation to after generation. Yes, exposure yes. is mm -hmm. huge yeah. to huge. me. If you don't know, you have you don't no know idea. You don't know. Yeah. True. Yeah. All right, Kathy? You know, I, I could... I, I could affirm everything that has been said up here, but you know, for, for goodwill, so much of it comes down to transportation that um, we offer an opportunity for employment, but if you can't get there, if it takes you, you know, two hours in the front end and two hours on the back end, and, you know, as an example, you know, we were employing, you know, two, three hundred people at our downtown facility right across from the farmer's market, but we ended up closing that and we moved out to Cockrell Bend which isn't that far from, from downtown, but MTA doesn't have a bus line. Now, there's 150 mm. people employed out there. When I called and asked, eventually what I got back was, well, you know, we lose money. You know, we, we, we can't make it work. And then I hear on the radio that Kansas City is a city that's looking at free, free bus pass. Mm -hmm. They're willing to give up $400,000 just so people can ride the bus and get to work. And, mm. you know, here we're incentivizing businesses, giving them millions of dollars in, in tax increment financing, you know, to come to Nashville. Yeah, you know, we can't take care of our own. And I think, to me, that's the most frustrating thing is, you know, at some point, charity begins at home. Right. Mm -hmm. And so. Demetrius, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, it's, it's uh, job preparedness for our students. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of opportunity with the Amazons coming in, but they uh, don't know the vehicles or the ways or the means to get, you know, their resumes out, you know, a 4.0. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to you, you man. I'm talk right here. I mean, really, we, we're, big, we're a pipeline, um, and it happened, we didn't intend for it to be, but to have 525 students sign up for your race, mm -hmm. and then employers out there saying, hey, you know, we, we need young talent. We need talent. We want this talent to stay in Nashville. We don't want them to move away. That's the biggest thing. It's like, we're going to lose them if they're going to do their cost of living index mm -hmm. and say, hey, $70,000 here, I can go back here. So we want to ensure and see that the students that we invest in for four years, that they stay here. But with the cost of living, they are looking to go elsewhere because they just want to maximize their dollars. So that's right. it's, we're doing all the work. We're, what if us, we partner and we take Jimmy 
from a freshman with a 1.8 GPA and build him up to this great thing, and then he leaves. And some other city gets the right, hard work that, that we've done. We need that talent to stay here because they need to come back and be sitting in these seats in the next three years. And we're seeing yes. our talent, but now we've created this, hey, I want to live a little bit larger, and I can afford a half a million dollar house <laughs> with right. no brick. <laughs> right, no, I understand. So one of the things that I definitely want to do, um, again, with kind of this show, with us kind of bridging the gap between everything, I want to hear from you all um, quickly as you can. I want to know, number one, what is it that do you have any upcoming things that are going on, any events, any programs that you want to get increased enrollment, any other things that you just want to share and make sure that people, businesses, community, students that, that they know about, just let us know what those are. Well, I mentioned at the onset that Dismas House has been around for four decades now, and during that time frame, we've always had eight beds. <clears throat> And we've received uh, annually roughly 350 applications with eight beds for people who are transitioning out of incarceration that want to be a part of our organization. So we embarked on an expansion project, and that expansion project has come to fruition. It was a $12 million project that we've raised roughly around $8 million for, and we've started construction, and construction will be complete. Uh, sometime in March, so we're planning to have a grand opening on April the 7th at 2424 Charlotte Avenue. Congratulations, we'll be for sure. If it wasn't for the support of the community believing in, in this cause and the population that we serve and our ability to help help them better themselves, then we wouldn't be there. But we're going from eight beds to 72, from 20 a year to 200 a year. So uh, I'm a very appreciative of the community support. Great. Talk about capacity building. Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, I just want to quickly say now that, you know, just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean you don't make a profit. Because if you don't make a profit, you're going to be out of business no, real quick. Um, so people can, you know, go to our website and find out more and all about you know, our events. But we got an event coming up on January 16th, which is our town hall, first town hall series. That's all going to that's going to be all about you know, uh, census. You know the importance of, of census and why everybody needs to be be counted. Um, then January 31st, you know, we'll do a legislative uh, town hall so that we know what's going on in our legisla legislature. And then we'll do a town hall now with uh, the governor, and then we'll we'll go from. from can there. I come along? Great, yeah, you can come real along. <laughs> Demetrius, real quick. Yep, uh, we're going to our tenth year. We're celebrating ten years next year, so we have our tenth annual Steps of Success 5K in September. Right. We're at a food festival with that, so. Uh, you can go to our website, stepsofsuccess5k.org. We want you to be a runner. Again, proceeds all benefit college scholarships, and we have our Pathway to Success initiative where we're looking for individuals who want to serve as speakers or, or do TED Talks in faith, education, leadership, and health and wellness. So Got visit it. our website, and we would love to connect. This is our big year to sustain the next decade. If there's things you no longer need, want, or use in your house coming on Christmas time, give it to Goodwill. If you want a job, come to one of Goodwill's career fairs. Great, gonna do it. Number one, I'm gonna I'm a run in the 5K. Yes. I'm coming to the grand opening. I already have some stuff that I've been putting in the garage. I'm not playing, I'm so serious. And Clinton, I'll be at a town hall meeting. So I just wanna say thank you all again for coming. We definitely appreciate you. It's a good opportunity for people to get to know what's going on. And thank you so much for watching D Connection TV.